Okay, good morning, church. It's wonderful to be together this morning. Welcome to all of you that are here with us in the sanctuary, and welcome to everyone that's watching at home as well. You are so welcome here to be part of the Selston Baptist Church family. We're really looking forward to hearing from David Rogers later today, um, so we really look forward to hearing from his word. But I'm just going to introduce now um, the worship group as we be still and worship in the presence of God. Our first song today is King of Kings, Majesty. Now, kings wear royal robes, don't they? Um, but this talks of us wearing royal robes, royal robes that we don't deserve. And this is all because of what Jesus, our Saviour, has done for us. So King of Kings, Majesty is our first song. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, live within me, gentle Savior, close of friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls out. I can but bow, I lay my own before you now. In all your robes, I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. As I never worship you. Brought the sinner you to your throne. For within me cries out in praise. Your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my own before you now. In I can but bow, I lay my own before you now. In royal robes, I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. second song is, is also a personal one, My Saviour, Jesus, My Saviour. And then the next song is Our God, Our God. So we sing together about My Saviour and about Our God. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My 
and comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roll at the sound of your name. Sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. You're my comfort, my comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, 
God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, oh, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Um, we shall now take up our offering. Nearly forgot to say, sorry. pray together now. Father God, we just thank you so much for these generous gifts of this offering here this morning, and we just pray for these gifts to be multiplied in your name, that more work can be carried out in your kingdom, both in Selsdon Baptist Church and in the community of Selsdon and further afield as well. We ask these things in your precious holy name. Amen. I'm now going to hand over to the All H. Thank you very much. One. Afraid you might have to think um, young at heart today because I think we're missing a few of our younger ones. So if you can be as young as you feel you can be this morning, that would be great. <laughs> um, change. There's been a lot of changes over uh, and during September. You've probably noticed the changes in the seasons, the, the darkness that's coming in in the evenings a lot quicker. I certainly notice because I take a dog out quite often, so I notice these changes. Maybe changes in your routines. Who's had to suddenly start taxiing people to football, to various different clubs maybe, and it's all become a, a slightly different routine to what it was over the summer. And that rather reminded me of, um, do you know the, 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 the story about a caterpillar? The, the very hungry caterpillar. I'm sure if you think back in your memories, it's one you may have read and you may have read to children, grandchildren, or you probably know the story quite well. Hopefully, anyway, it's certainly one that's stuck in my mind. And you may remember it begins something like, in the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. Does that come to mind? Yeah, and out, thank you, <laughs> and out jumped this little caterpillar. Isn't he lovely? And this caterpillar got terribly hungry and it decides to eat rather a lot of things. And this is where we need to have a little bit of movement. So if you're feeling energetic, then feel free to come and help me. And this caterpillar decided it was, as it was hungry, that on Monday, it could actually eat one very nice juicy green apple. Now, if you look under your chair or along your row, can anyone spot a nice juicy green apple somewhere? If you can, can you bring it up and... 
come and pop it in my bag, please? Or give it to someone? Thank you, Jane. Well, <laughs> red and green. It was a long time ago this morning. <laughs> Thank you. For, yeah, lovely. Okay. And on Tuesday, two pairs. They're green. Has anyone got two pairs there hiding? Have to have a look. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so this, this caterpillar is getting used to eating. It's like, like me it, in the bag. Thank you. It's enjoying. I'm going to put the caterpillar in there. He's going to enjoy all these lovely things that God created. Wednesday, we've got two, three plums. Has anyone got three plums hiding away? Oh, great. Isaac, well done. Excellent. Well done, you've spotted them. So they're going to the caterpillar. He's going to have a nice feed this morning. On Thursday, four strawberries. Is anyone hiding four strawberries? I've put them in a little box, so hopefully you haven't been tempted to eat them. Well done, Annette. Brilliant. So this caterpillar's doing well. It's eating just what I like to do, lots of food. And on Friday, five oranges. Well done, excellent. So he's doing well. And on Saturday, he, I think his tummy must be extremely empty. On Saturday, chocolate cake, ice cream cones. If you've got any of these, bring them up. Cheese, salami, lollipops, cherry pie. It's actually a Bakewell tart, but don't tell anyone. Sausage, a cupcake. Oh, look at that. This caterpillar. Thank you, Emma. Brilliant. Thank you, Pat. Oh, look at that. Brilliant. Well done. Pop it in the bag. He's doing rather well. I think he might be getting a bit bigger. And note the change. Pasta shapes and John West tuna. It did appear in the story, didn't it? No. No. Okay. Right. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> so... Sometimes things don't say, stay the same. They change, don't they? And sometimes we're not always that keen when it's different, but that happens. And this caterpillar, you'll have to use your imagination a bit, had eaten so much. <laughs> had eaten so much, you got Rob. Oh, and another thing. Well done. Well done. Pop it in there. He'll have that later. Well done. He got so huge for eating all those things. Can anyone tell me what happened next? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no? Well, he wrapped himself in a rather amazing story, isn't it? In a cocoon. It's amazing what you can find when you're looking. <laughs> in a cocoon, and he had, as you would need to, a very long sleep. Now, Nathaniel, you've helped me with the next bit. Where are you hiding? He's gone outside. Okay. Well, Na Nathaniel... Can you just remind everybody what happened after the cat? He turned, hold it up so we can see. <laughs> so he's made that for us this morning. So well done, Nathaniel. That's great. Now, thank you. Don't disappear. We need you back. <laughs> and Isaac, we, we'd be lovely to keep you if we can at, uh, at some point. Yeah. Come, take a seat. Nearly done. Thank you. So, um, lots of changes happening to that caterpillar. He just had to eat, didn't he? And uh, that's what I love to do. But, um, but sometimes with change, change, changes mean maybe different things. And we would like to talk to you a little bit about our children this morning. We're a bit sad because we don't see that many, but sometimes we have quite a few. But this week they've decided, I think, not to come. So I'm just going to hand out to, over to Pauline, who's just going to talk a little bit about our Sunday club.
Good, good, good. Right, okay, I um, head up the Sunday Club, and um, like Mahiri said, unfortunately, we've only got a few children here this morning, but we were going to do a presentation because they've been coming regularly over the last year, quite a few of them, so we were going to reward them with a book. But um, we've got one, one, one boy that's going up into Katie's group, Kaylin, so she's got a new one starting, hopefully he's been coming the last couple of weeks. And we've got some little four-year-olds that are going up into the, the bigger group upstairs. So maybe if they'd want to come up now, we've got um, Destiny, Amaya and Emma. Would you like to come up and receive your book? Do you come this way? This way? <laughs> want to go out to play. Right, Destiny, you want to come upstairs and receive your book? Emma? Okay, that's it. Okay, we've, got a few that's it. we've got a few little older boys. We've got William, if he'd like to come up, and Nathaniel. And anyone else I've forgotten who's hiding? I think that's all the children, isn't it? We've got Isaac that's just gone outside, but um, he's here, yeah. So we have uh, another one in crash, yeah. As you can see, we were expecting a lot more this morning, but fortunately we've got a few here, which is nice. And um, we were thinking, as um, some of them, it's all changed for some of them. These, well, some of these little ones have started big school. And um, like I say, um, Kaylin, he's gone up to senior school. And um, we've got about six, I think, that are looking for senior schools for next year. Because as most of you know, you have to prepare a year in advance for what you want to do. So I was thinking we could maybe pray some of the parents their guidance to choose what school because there's rather a lot of senior schools in Croydon and it's a big decision to, to fill in that form which one is right for your child so maybe we can have a time of prayer now just um, praying for those parents and families Father we thank you for the children that come to this church regularly and the privilege that we have as teachers mm -hmm. teaching them and leading them teaching them your word and we bring to you especially at this time the families that are looking to which senior school to choose for next September for their children. And we pray that you would give them guidance as which one to choose. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Right, children, we're going to go into the placing of English and singing this morning. So can you help us? Follow me. Yeah. Off we go. That's it. This way. That's it. Thanks very much, Pauline, for uh, for doing that. Um, good morning, everyone. Youth are going out as well, apparently, with Casey. Yeah. <laughs> so if, you're, if you want to be part of that, then go and, uh, and make a run for it now. Yeah, I knew you'd be lurking somewhere or other. It's nice to be back at this point where we have a procession of youth slowly going out, numbers growing, it is good, we are blessed with that. Um, a couple of announcements very quickly this morning. Um, Harvest, just to let you know, is on the 9th of October. Um, Danny Morris is going to be preaching here for that. Um, we'll, um, we're doing a collection um, for international needs, um, a project they've got with disabled children in Uganda. 
Um, so I've got a load of notes that were sent over to me, so I just need to make sure I get over everything to them. And we're also collecting food for the, um, the Vine Food Bank in New Addington. Um, and there's going to be a list of things that are suitable for that, which will be coming out in church news. Um, baptismal classes. We've got some baptismal classes starting on 13th of October. If you are interested at all in baptism in any way, shape, or form, um, then please speak to Katie or Trevor um, about this. There's no commitment to get baptized at the end of it. It's just coming along and finding out more about what's involved in that. Um, and then the other equally exciting thing is diaconate elections. Whee! Um, there should be a letter coming out this week if I manage to get it sorted out and organized. Um, do please pray um, as we try and work out who it is that's going to be part of the, the leadership team over the coming few years. Um, so your prayers for that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Right, I think that's all the announcements. Um, let's switch into different gear and hope that I've got a big enough font here that I can actually read what I've got because I left the glasses in the car. Um, so we are, we've got a reading this morning from Joshua 3, um, the whole of Joshua 3. So it's entitled Crossing the Jordan. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits, that's about 900 meters, between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's water, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan's at flood stage or during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the waters from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Um, we're really pleased that um, David is going to be preaching to us this morning. David, it's great to see you here. Thank you very much indeed. Do you want to come up and I'll, I'll say a prayer and then uh, I'll get out of your way. <laughs> Father, we pray that uh, you'll bless David this morning as he brings your word to us and pray that you'll open our hearts as we hear all that you have to say to us through his word this morning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Andy, very much. It's uh, great to be here. Lovely uh, to see you, see quite a few um, old faces, as it were, as in I know your faces rather than being rude about your age, though you can be rude about mine, all right? Um, uh, but also some new folks. So you might not know who I am. I'm minister of Crone Road Baptist Church, which is just a mile or so down 
the road, and I've had quite a strong connection with Selsden, partly through um, your previous and your existing minister, Trevor, but partly also because as Baptists we do this funny thing whereby a nearby minister helps a church when they're in interregnum and chairs meetings and all sorts of things like that. And it fell to my lot um, when uh, you were in that phase before Trevor came to come. So I developed a really lovely relationship with Selston, and there's always a place in my heart um, for this church. So it's great to be here uh, again. Just a pity Trevor's not here, actually. I hope he's uh, getting the rest that he probably really deserves um, and needs. Um, if he were here, I would then be able to ask him a little bit more about how far you've got through your series, because you're clearly through a series, um, or started a series going through Joshua. I think the truth of the matter is, you've probably only had one sermon so far, because I think you're probably doing one chapter one time. And Trevor said, look, because of what's happened recently in the world, I didn't do chapter two. So uh, because chapter two hasn't been done by him, we're leaping to chapter three that he asked me some months ago to put in my diary, and he's going back to chapter two. So we are looking at crossing the Jordan. And when I preach, I use PowerPoint. Um, it's kind of deaf by PowerPoint. Um, so uh, I will be saying to Ros, can you move on, please? Um, which is what I'm going to do now. So Ros, that's the title slide. Um, uh, so I'm, I just want to kind of remind you, possibly Trevor did that last time, putting everything into context, thinking about um, the book, book of Deuteronomy, the last of the first five, Five books, the Torah. Um, it concludes the Torah. At the end of that, you've got Moses' final speech. We've already been looking at change. There's a big moment of change between Moses and the end of the Exodus and Joshua and the beginning of the next phase of the life of the nation. And in that last speech, Moses tells them everything that's happened in the previous 40 years, reminds them within Deuteronomy of the Ten Commandments, or they repeat it again, and tells them about what is, in essence, what the book of Deuteronomy and the Torah is all about. Listen to the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul, and so on, and choose the Lord because he chose them. And that is, that's the first thing I want to say, is do you know God has chosen you? Just a little putting it out there question, because that's what, I, this isn't Joshua yet, we haven't got on to Joshua, um, but, but just, just think about it. Do you know that God has chosen you? Okay, so Joshua, Deuteronomy ends with Joshua being confirmed as Moses' successor. It has Moses' death, Israel on the threshold of the promised land, and so we then leap into Joshua. And we're going to move on to our next slide. And isn't Joshua relevant to our moment? Moses is dead. Joshua is the next leader. Moses has been that absolute rock and pillar for the whole society. What has Queen Elizabeth II meant to us? The majority of us. I think someone calculated that 96% of the world's population have been born in the time that Queen Elizabeth uh, was on the throne. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? So the vast majority of us have actually been born in her lifetime. So if you're older than 70, then you're one of the rare 4% uh, in those uh, statistics. The queen is dead. Long live the king. I do find it so much easier talking about Charles or Prince Charles than King Charles because we've had 70 years talking about Prince Charles, haven't we? So, there's, so we find ourselves in society in a place of big change and a new season. So Joshua, you know, God knew what he was doing when he encouraged Trevor and the leaders to say, let's look at jo Joshua because 
It's in a season where we are in, in our community and in our society. It's also a season where the church is in. Yesterday, it was lovely to see some of you at West Croydon Baptist Church where Denzel was being inducted as their new minister. Much excitement for them. Mixed emotions, I think, for those from Selsden who were saying goodbye to Denzel. But we have to understand we are in a bigger picture. And, and there is a sense in which all of us, whilst on the one hand we hear that affirmation God has chosen us, yet on the other hand God also has a habit of moving us around a little bit like chess pieces, except we're voluntary chess pieces as well. He says, will you please go to that point on the chessboard? It's not just he shoves us there. But there is that sense that he knows the plan. And so we have to trust that God knows what he's doing in moving Denzel and Jemima into an area where there is a lot of work to be done in West Croydon, but if he knows what he's doing there, he knows what he's doing here too. He's not abandoning Selsden. So he knows what he's doing. And he's left the church with good leaders. Oh, so let's move on. Chapters 1 to 5, Joshua's main sections, the new leader and the preparations for moving into the promised land. So chapter 3, where we are, is part of that. Then it'll be the campaigns against the Canaanites. Then it will be allocating the promised land. And then right at the end, rather like Moses had this speech right at the end of Deuteronomy, Joshua will also have his concluding address. So, last time, I wouldn't mind laying money on the fact that this was the key start, the key part of the passage. Joshua 1, 1 to 9, and especially verse 9. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now that's really important because in our passage, did you notice one of the very early things that was said is you have never been this way before. Verse 4, you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. So tie in what was looked at last time in terms of verse 9, um, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go with you've never been this way before. So guess whose hand you've got to hold? That's what Joshua is uh, trying to say. So today we are looking at crossing the Jordan River. Look at that picture, and I hope those of you at home, if you, you haven't got two small devices, you can see the slide there and look at it. Extra biscuits, if you have biscuits with your refreshments, if you can spot the two things that are not quite right with that picture. One of them I'm going to point out during the next bit of the sermon, but there are two things not quite right with that picture, okay? A bit of artist's license being used there. Okay, so let's, let's move on quickly. We've got quite a few slides to get through. So the first thing that happens is preparation. If you look in verse 1, you read that they camped that place, Shittim, slightly unfortunate name, isn't it? It means acacias. So you can now imagine that here is a place where there's a lovely stand of acacia trees or loads of acacias, lots of shade for the people. Uh, so it's a good place for them to camp and to get ready. They camped before, before crossing over. So there's a pause going on here. Verse 2, we're told something of the extent of that pause. After three days, the officers went through the camp. And what I'm reading into this and understanding here is that God sometimes says to us, don't be in too much of a hurry to rush ahead into the next thing. Moses is dead, Joshua is the new leader, let's go. The queen is dead, long live the king, 
it's really important for there to be continuity so that there's not the danger of some usurper coming along or all sorts of other things happening, certainly in, in, in history. But actually, sometimes, even when there is that new leadership, there needs to be a pause. And, and I think this is probably the word for our generation because we've become an increasingly fast generation. And God wants us to resist falling into the traps that our rest of our generation encourages us to, which is just to get faster and faster and faster, but sometimes just to hit pause. Why? Well, just so we can listen, so we can hear him. If we're too busy running, going, doing, we're not pausing to listen. So let's pause. Let's, before crossing over, before the three days or during the three days. So there is a need for preparation. There's a very important reason for preparation as well because Joshua says, consecrate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves in verse 5. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things before you. Let me just ask you a question. Do you pause and pray before coming to church on a Sunday? Or indeed, before going out to work on a Monday? Do we actually think about what we're doing when we come to church? What frame of mind are we in as we come into God's presence? Because this is what Joshua is actually wanting the Israelites to think about in this moment, is how, how are they approaching God? Because God is about to do something among them. I mean, the first thing about consecration is actually paying attention. Paying attention to God actually focusing on him. And that's really part of what I'm saying is, is where are our minds? Are our minds on God or are our minds all over the place? The first part of consecration is focusing on God. The second part of it is being aware of who we are and who he is. Isaiah 6, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. It's that sense of the holiness of God, the awesome, almighty, the one into whose presence we come, who is wholly other than us, and how little small specks we are compared to him. And like Isaiah, we need to have that humility before God before he then comes along and touches our lips and says, look, you've just come before me. You've consecrated yourself before me. You're now ready. And that's what Joshua is wanting to do here, is to get the people ready for what's coming next so that they and God work together. So that's what we need to be doing in this season, is what is God wanting to do with us? Let's consecrate ourselves and get ready for that. Let's move on, shall we, quickly. Um, so, to the next slide. Um, not only um, do we, well, yes, thank you, Ros, I haven't touched the last bit. I am not really going to touch the last bit, which is representatives, but did you notice in this passage, um, Joshua says, choose 12 people, and those 12 people are going to get some stones. And I'm not going to say any more about that because then I'm stealing thunder from Trevor for not next time because he's going back to chapter 2, but the one beyond when he's looking at chapter 4, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> actually chapters 3 and 4 belong together and kind of they are the, the, the crossing. But, but there's that sense that there's preparation going on here as well in terms of them being aware. And it'll all be to do with looking backwards, looking forward, looking backwards as well. So let's move on to the next slide then because I know I've still got some other things to say. So there's preparation in this passage, and there's also two really important messages too. There is a personal message to Joshua. I mean, can you imagine how 
King Charles is feeling at the moment. Um, or for that matter, of course, we've had a new prime minister as well. Um, who completely, two days into the job, and she is totally overshadowed <laughs> by everybody else and everything else that is going on. Um, so, so a new king, new prime minister, how are they feeling at the moment about themselves and about the role that they have taken on? And particularly in the case of Charles' case, the big shoes that he is having to where those of his mother and so god has a personal message to joshua in verse 7 today i will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all israel it's not very british is it to exalt ourselves and we think it's it's you know if someone starts you know i'm the best thing since sliced bread or whatever we very quickly jump to that person is arrogant and even we're slightly uncomfortable when we read those passages where paul gives us a long list of what he's done and who he is and how gifted and how god has used him we think lord you really need to do all of that and yet i i, I do want us to understand that we need to have a sense of identity and a sense of self-worth and a sense of security that God has put within us. The message of Deuteronomy, I have chosen you to be my people, should be giving us security that we belong to him. There is real significance for Joshua in being told by God, look, my job as God is not to humiliate you. So shall we put it the other way around? Because we're very uncomfortable with the idea of, I plan to exalt you. But we are often in danger of thinking that God seems to be the bad teacher, you know, the one who didn't really learn how to be a good teacher, who only wants to see our faults and our problems and put the red pen through all our work and seems to think that his job is to knock us down. No, that's insecure people who knock us down and God is anything but insecure. He is the almighty. He is the most powerful. He does not undercut us and humiliate us. He lifts us. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who emptied himself. Why? In order to elevate and lift us and teach us to lift other people as well. He is in the business of lifting up his children. So one, God has chosen us. Two, God loves to elevate us, exalt us and honor us. Hear it. It's not me saying it, it's God's word that is saying it. Now, of course, it is related to the consecration bit that goes before. You can't have the one without the other. And then the other message, um, which is for the whole nation, and therefore you might, you might argue that that message was for Joshua, but I think the principle that God wanting to elevate people and honor people is an, a, a principle that stands through the whole of Scripture. But certainly, the passage that is coming for the people to hear the second message, you will know that the living God is among you. And actually, that is what crossing the Jordan is all about. And it's not only that they know it, it's that the rest of the world knows it um, as well. Um, so actually, let's move on to um, the next slide um, and, and ask ourselves the question again, do we think that God intends to exalt or humiliate our king? Well, if he listens to the words of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and if he holds true to what he's promised in one or two of his addresses since his mother died, then I think God will actually guide and lead him as God led 
and guided his mother. Why are her shoes so big? Because she consecrated herself. And so God honored and exalted her in the same way as he honored other people. Mel Nelson Mandela is one of the people who I think stands out as somebody else that God honored. So, the people of Israel are going to know that God is living among them, but do we know that God is living among us? In the UK, in London, in Croydon, in Selsden. He's the Lord of the universe. Of course he's here. Does he want to work here? Yes. This morning the Lord reminded me as I was having my quiet time of Isaiah 43. You are precious and you are honored in my sight. I think that's what he wants Selsden to hear. You are precious. And he wants to make good use of you and he wants you to know that he, the living God, is here and is at work. Moving on quickly to the next slide, which actually is not moving on, but moving backwards. There's a little reminder to us, which you won't have had yet because you've not had the sermon, um, about um, Rahab. Uh, Rahab in chapter 2, that is the prostitute in Jericho, tells the spies that the Lord's impressive reputation has already gone ahead of them. So if you look in chapter 2, and particularly in verses 10 and 11, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And then goes on and what done to some of the kings of the Amorites and so on and so forth. And when we heard of it, our hearts sank. So the reputation, you know, we sometimes forget what God has done and other people have to remind us what God has done or what God is doing. We sometimes can't see because we're so involved in the problems and the issues that actually God's been at work and someone else has to say to us. And here is Rahab. At the moment, she doesn't yet belong to God's people, but she's going to fit into Matthew's genealogy um, because she will become part of God's people. But at this point, she's just a person who acknowledges the existence of God, and tells his people what God's been uh, doing. So we move on to the crossing itself, which is, let, let's face it, what chapter 3 is essentially about. So, can anyone tell me what either of the things are wrong in the passage? Yes. Oh, well done. That's the one I'm not going to comment on. So, 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 yes, yes, exactly. There should be a lot of gap. This whole thing of consecrating and thinking of the holiness of God and the ark is representing the presence of God, which I will come on to in a moment. So what's the other thing? The water's not far enough away. You are absolutely right. Yes. You were paying attention to Andy as he was reading the passage or reading it properly um, as well. So um, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, here is actually a crossing of the Jordan that took place in 1918 in April. Now, we might be slightly confused because we read that um, verse 15, the Jordan is in flood all during harvest. Uh, now, I'm missing harvest at my church today. In fact, hopefully I have a cup of coffee or something here, and I'm going to dash back because I want to see the harvest display before it all gets um, broken up because I grew four really nice pumpkins, and I want to see them there. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so, and you've got harvest in a couple of weeks' time here as well. So we have our mindset thinking harvest is autumn time. But when we read the word harvest in the Hebrew here, what it's really talking is the time of productivity, which is anything from spring all the way through to what we would think of of autumn. Because in the Mediterranean, the growing is going on and the fruit is going on all the time. And remember, Jesus expected to find fruit on the fig tree because actually last autumn's new figs would then be ripening in the early part of spring. Stuff like that is going on. 
Um, we also know that it was springtime, partly because when you do get to chapter 4, you read in verse 19, on the tenth day of the first month, and the month is Nisan, which is in our terms March-April time, and actually that is all li aligning it with Passover as well. So the crossing of the Jordan is seen to connect with Passover and to connect with the Red Sea. That's why Rahab has already mentioned it in chapter 2. So what was going on with Moses as leader is going on with Joshua as leader. What God has done with one, God will do with the other, and therefore God will do in subsequent generations. What God has done with them, he can do with us and amongst us as well. Um, so the river is in flood, and the reason the river is in flood is because it's spring and because that massive great mountain at the north called Hermon has a lot of snow on it. Even in modern Israel, they have ski resorts there. Um, so springtime, it melts. Where does he go? Down the Jordan. Where does he go? Down through, down to the Dead Sea. So the river is in flood. That is, so, so what this is saying is even when the river is in flood, nothing is going to stop God from doing what he wants uh, to do. And I've mentioned surprise there, because if you are the Canaanites, they are quivering in their shoes, but one thing they think is on their side is the river. The river's in flood. We've got time to get ready for these wretched Israelites who are over there that we've heard about and we're frightened about. And all of a sudden, the river is dry. And they're not ready. Been caught rather like the Russians have been caught by the Ukrainians recently. <laughs> Moving on quickly. So, how does it actually happen? Well, it happens in a place called, uh, well, it could be Adam. I prefer to call it Adam, actually. Sorry, Adam, I'm not going to call you Adam, all right? Uh, <laughs> um, and here is a picture where there used to be three crossings. Uh, it still has got that, can you see the etymology in its modern name, Damia? Um, and there's a, there's a bridge there. Can you see on the picture how the river is kind of sunk in there? It's nothing like as wide as it is over um, the Jordan. But let's move on quickly to the next um, slide. What I particularly want you to see, this is me being a bit of a geographer here, is at Damier there are loads of marl hills. I mean, there's loads of marl all around that part of the world anyway, but, but especially the Jordan has dug there. It's one of the reasons why it's such a deep, 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 deep valley. It's the deepest valley on earth um, because of the softness of the sediments and marl is very, very soft. And what does that mean? It means, moving to the next slide, it means that actually sometimes the marl cliffs collapse and especially at times of flood, because there's lots of water that undermines them. And so the Jordan has stopped in history at least three times that we know of. In 1267, there was a flood in which the river was dammed at Damier for 11 hours. In 1546, there was an earthquake. The area is tectonically very active. Um, three days, the river was held back. 1927. 21 hours. Now, some people might say, David, are you suggesting that this is not a miracle? No, I'm not. And actually, I want to ask you a question. How do you view natural events, and how do you view supernatural events? And how do you think God views them? We're the only ones who think about miracles and supernatural. Because when you're God, everything's natural. Everything is what you're capable of doing. It's what he does. It's just our perspective. And, and actually, if you read um, the passage here, we read that... Um, I was paying attention to it as Andy was reading it, um, because it was something I hadn't picked up so much during my preparation, um, it, there was a particular reference to the fact that the water will be cut off. I think it's verse 13. The waters flowing downstream will be cut off. And you find yourself asking, oh, 
How are you going to do that, God? Now, the crucial thing about whether it's supernatural or natural, to my mind, is always the timing. And though the crucial thing here is the point at which we read as soon as, as soon as, as soon as the priests stepped off and their feet touched the water. Why? Because the priests are holding the ark. And you've got that sense of conductivity. That's, you use your imagine to think about that. That sense of conductivity of the presence of God working through the ark, through the priests who they definitely have consecrated themselves. And so they are holy and have the presence of God. And it's the presence of God that touches the water. And you can imagine it like a lightning bolt going up the river and then boom goes the cliff. And then you have 20 miles of dry water, because that's dry riverbed. Hence, you can have at least 900 meters between the ark and the other people. They can give it a wide berth as they cross opposite Jericho. So plenty, plenty of space that's going there. And all this is actually saying is God is sovereign. And as he demonstrates his sovereignty over the power of nature, a reminder of what he did in defeating the Egyptians, it's a promise of what he's going to do in terms of opening up the promised land to them. And also, as well as indicating his power, it is a promise of his presence. Given to Joshua last time, in chapter 1, I will be with you. And then in the message to the people, the people will know that the living God is with them. So let's finish. The Lord has promised a land for his people. It's part of his plan. And now what we're seeing is he's beginning to deliver on that. Chapter 3 is the opening lines of that. They need to prepare. They need to consecrate themselves. It's really important for us to take time to consecrate ourselves, to spend time with God, to empty ourselves, um, to pay attention to him, to allow him to cleanse us, and then to trust him that he knows what he's doing even when we've not been that way before, as the passage says. And then just hear, Deuteronomy, I've chosen you. Joshua, I will exalt you. Let that be a message for you as a church. But most of all, know the living God. The living God was at work amongst Joshua and the people of Israel. The same living God is at work here amongst Southern Baptist Church. And the evidence was that the river stopped flowing. And we need to be looking for the signs of what God is doing here and giving thanks to him. Let's pray. Father God, we've already been reminded in this service that we are in a time of change. And so were the people of Israel but you gave messages uh, of assurance to Joshua, the leader. You gave messages to the people that you are God. Oh, Father God, how we thank you that in our world of change, you are still God. You are still powerful. You are still wonderful. You still choose your people and you've chosen us. And you still want to lift and elevate and honor your children. May we, for our part, offer ourselves, consecrate ourselves, give ourselves, and follow trustingly and obediently your ways, your will, your word. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen.
Well, you won't be surprised that we are going to sing Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah with that uh, lovely line of When I Tread the Verge of Jordan. So let's stand and sing. Guide me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. Feed me now and evermore. Open now the crystal. Whence the healing stream doth flow, let the fiery cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. Still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, did my anxious fears subside? Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. So song continues the same theme of God being supreme, uh, God reigning in our lives, and it's a prayer asking God to reign in our lives. Over every thought, over every on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour. You are the Lord of all I am. So that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So that you reign in me again. Oh, would you reign in me?
David, thank you very much for the, for the encouraging message this morning. That's really good. Um, do please come and join us for tea and coffee afterwards um, through there. It would be great to, to see you and have a chat with you afterwards. Uh, and before we leave, I'm just going to say a blessing. I pray that uh, you all know how great God's love is for you, the width, the depth, the height, uh, how amazing it is. And I pray throughout this week that you will know that God really loves you all. Amen. Thank you very much.